Good morning. My name is Susumulu Shoinka. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Philadelphia's Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services, and I serve as the County Lead for the 980 Transformation, or what we call Crisis 2.0. I'm also a practicing psychiatrist and uh, work in crisis care. Um, and so what I'll be presenting is uh, Philadelphia's uh, alternative to police response in the era of 988. And to set the stage, uh, what Philadelphia has done is a complete uh, top to bottom transformation of our crisis response. This actually began back in 2017. But meant to you is our work certainly around mobile crisis services but also the other elements of this crisis transformation. So this is a slide that summarizes what I just said. The effort to transform the crisis system for Philadelphia began back in 2017 and initially focused on the children's uh, system, the crisis system. And that effort was completed by 2018. And in 2019, the uh, effort around the adult crisis services began, and this was um, uh, catalyzed in October 2020 by the tragic shooting death of Walter Wallace, who was a young man in West Philadelphia who was uh, experiencing a mental health crisis and was killed by police, uh, Philadelphia police. And so that led to a renewed sense of urgency with exceptional support from city council around this and, and our state partners around this effort. So the bottom as, uh, part of this slide shows you the different elements of the crisis transformation. So this includes obviously the main thing that we'll be talking about today, which is the short and long-term mobile service, mobile crisis response teams, but it also includes uh, having developed co-responder teams that, that comprise both the behavioral health and a public safety response with Philadelphia police. And uh, we've also added a couple of different elements intended to expand the menu of options for Philadelphians experiencing a crisis. Those include uh, adding a fifth crisis response center, a behavioral health care urgent center, urgent care center, and expanding our crisis call center capacity. And this slide basically shows you the uh, the different, the way the different elements uh, of the crisis center of this crisis expansion, both the external pieces, which are the things I talked about, mobile crisis response teams or CMCRT, the crisis intervention and stabilization teams, which are the longer term engagement uh, teams, they, they engage over about a six week period. And then the crisis intervention and response teams, which comprise police officers, trained CIT trained officers and trained behavioral health counselors. And then the other two elements I mentioned. In the middle, you have the uh, what we think of as the internal infrastructure, uh, which uh, supports that external expansion, which is the core of that is the expansion and I would say retraining and reposition of the Philadelphia crisis line, PCL and other efforts that were made to uh, standardize the operations of that team, including licensure and accreditation. And then one of the pieces that we're particularly happy with here in Philadelphia has been the embedding of mobile, of a crisis call center staff, PCL staff, in the 911 radio room, which adds the additional capacity to deflect persons in crisis from a police response. And we are also in the process of standing up a care traffic control system or a data infrastructure IT hub that will help, that will serve as the nerve center or platform to coordinate all these efforts and then a data sharing portal. And on the right, you can see an effort of the scale obviously requires tremendous coordination with a, a number of external uh, partners, including our state committees, which Philadelphia is actively engaged in. Uh, we have in, uh, and I'll talk about this a little further, the mobile team learning collaborative, which helped to bring together all stakeholders involved in this effort and uh, helped us get aligned in terms of the, the 
preferred outcomes, the deliverable standardizing the approach to care, and really sort of getting on the same page as far as what success looked like. And the care crisis steering committee, which is an internal uh, uh, group uh, within the organization, DBHIDS, County Mental Health Authority. And then one of the pieces that I really want to underscore is the family crisis reform group. This is a group of people with lived experience, families with lived experience, or who have lived through the experience of having a loved one in crisis or experience crisis services. And this group was critical to giving us feedback on our plans. Now, um, I can't say enough about how helpful this, this uh, effort was to engage this, this group in particular. And they've really been helpful in shaping the way we, we've thought about crisis services. Now, these are the core, these, this is uh, another slide that basically shows, I'm sorry, go back for a moment here, that basically shows the, that the efforts here within Philadelphia the Crisis Continuum are consistent with the core components of 988. So a person in crisis needs somebody to talk to, which is the Philadelphia Crisis Line or 988. Uh, the mobile crisis dispatch, uh, the mobile crisis teams respond to persons in crisis, and I'll show you data that show uh, how what that looks like here in Philadelphia, and then somewhere to go if needed. And then Philadelphia has also taken a very intentional approach towards post-crisis uh, intervention or postvention, which means that when we understand that a crisis doesn't turn itself off like a switch, people. Uh, even after they've had that initial front end response to their crisis, oftentimes need additional back end uh, uh, support, which could include referral to outpatient services, uh, wraparound services if needed, and so on. So, to just kind of circle back to the initial, my initial comments. Um, the background to 988 obviously was the National Suicide Hotline designation. Act of 2020, which mandated uh, the formation or establishment of the 98 uh, number, which now route calls through the National Suicide Prevention Line to all centers. And this went live in on July the 16th, 2022. And uh, Philadelphia was honored to be selected as a model city to host the launch of 98 on July the 15th of 2022. Um, in, during which we were, again, honored to host uh, Secretary Javier Becerra and other members of the cabinet here in Philadelphia, as well as officials from SAMHSA. And uh, the overall impact of 988, projected impact, is an increase in crisis call volume by 30 to 40% nationally. Now, I will pause here and just invite us to think about that. So. Essentially, what 988 does is a, a number of things. It's it's a standardized, centralized uh, resource for anybody in crisis. But what it is, in essence, is uh, a, a gigantic front door for persons in crisis to come knock and say, hey, look, I need services. Well, some people, and the data actually bears that some people's crisis will be resolved simply uh, through a phone call but a number of those people will require additional ongoing services over time. And so it's important to think about, yes, absolutely building that front door, building the crisis and services, building the call center services, building the mobile capacity, but we also have to think about and be mindful of the implications for ongoing service capacity in the systems. And this was the, graphic uh, or formula that we used in Philadelphia to calculate how many additional crisis center staff we needed. And I will say we have doubled our crisis call center capacity over the uh, interim from 2019 till date. And that effort continues till now. So we'll get to mobile crisis teams in a, in a, in a minute, but to kind of tie up the discussion around the crisis line, most people know this already, but the differences between 911 and 988 are significant. In a sense, 911 is a relay station or a relay hub where a person calls in in crisis and the uh, dispatcher basically offers a, a, a number of options, fire, EMS, law enforcement, and then dispatches that person. 988, on the other hand, uh, is the, in, in under 988, the contact is the intervention and data in Philadelphia 
shows that up to 90%, and I think maybe over 90% uh, at times of calls have been resolved uh, just through that phone call, that one phone call. So Christ counselors take that call and, uh, and deploy a number of skills and strategies to de-escalate that person's crisis and then offer additional resources. It could be a referral to um, uh, um, other resources in the system outpatient could and oftentimes is a mobile crisis team dispatch. And uh, again, I'll show you that data in a few minutes. And uh, it also could be uh, in on occasion, uh, it, it also is appropriate to dispatch the uh, poor response teams uh, sometimes or, or transfer the call back to 911 when there's a safety concern. Uh, but the majority of our calls end up being resolved uh, within the behavioral crisis system. So the 988 effort is has been a tremendous asset in helping to focus our crisis transformation efforts and elevate them um, in, a, in a significant way. So pivoting now to the mobile crisis, the CMCRT or the mobile community mobile crisis response teams. I did mention that this is the this was the the another key piece to Philadelphia's crisis transformation. So as of now, Philadelphia has expanded from two providers, that is two agencies that manage and operate mobile crisis services and expanded that to four agencies that manage and operate crisis services. And uh, right now we have 24 seven regionalized citywide coverage. Uh, and overall we have between 15 to 20 teams that cover shifts throughout the day and evening and overnight and weekends. And we also have uh, set up bridge teams, which means that during peak periods, Philadelphia has those, those agencies are able to deploy additional teams to cover the increased demand. And this has been tremendously helpful because one of the challenges that we had historically in Philadelphia is we had just uh, two teams, and and uh, if you can imagine a city of the size of Philadelphia with the needs of our populace, it oftentimes we were challenged by um, dispatch time, which is one of our core metrics, and and sort of which oftentimes led to a very binary, uh, simple decision: did that person need to go to a crisis center for additional services or or intervention, or could they stay in the community? And so this has been actually a huge um, um uh, uh, effort here in Philadelphia. Now, what are the what is the configuration? We call it the Philadelphia model. Important to this is important to underscore. And there are three types of personnel that are, that are represented on our teams. The first is a behavioral crisis intervention specialist, so a behavioral health trained and oftentimes licensed person a medical professional that is somebody who can screen and uh, respond in the short term to any medical needs. And we recognize that oftentimes behavioral health needs are core, core with medical issues. And then uh, we also have, as part of the Philadelphia model, incorporated the role of a certified peer specialist or family advocate. And that has been tremendously helpful. The teams that are charged with essentially to the extent possible resolving the crisis in the in the moment. So they engage, screen, assess, provide resolution, focus crisis intervention, de-escalate. Oftentimes, it just will develop a safety plan, and they also have the capacity to link or transfer uh, the, that individual to appropriate treatment. And as I mentioned, there is the short term and the longer term uh, engagement teams. One other important piece I should talk about is that our teams also work to resolve social determinants, which are oftentimes a trigger for the crises. This is a mission, and this was a uh, this was part of the vision of our commissioner, Dr. Jill Bowen, which really essentially was a recognition that Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods. So the needs of a person in Germantown is very different from somebody in South Philly or Mount Erie. And, uh, and so it's a recognition that each region or neighborhood has a specific character and set of uh, needs that may be very different than other neighborhoods. And so building on this and on historical data, 
Philadelphia essentially regionalized the uh, mobile crisis services and then contracted with these specific providers to deliver those services. So you have Central Philadelphia served by JFK, uh, West Northwest Philadelphia served by Elwyn, Northeast Philadelphia served by PATH, and South and Southwest Philadelphia served by the consortium. One of the benefits of this regionalization is it promotes not just the awareness of the needs of the community, but it builds relationships. So over time, our mobile teams have been able to are, are building uh, relationships with referral agencies, relationships with agencies, uh, social services, relationships with leaders in those communities that allow them, it, over time, we think will resolve, it will result in crises being resolved before they build to the sort of critical point where they need a more active intervention. So essentially that will be family members or leaders calling the crisis team and say, hey, look, we have this person that we know who's beginning to show signs of getting into crises and we'd like you to talk to them before that gets to a critical point. Now, what is our overall to summarize our approach and our sort of core values, Philadelphia recognizes that, particularly in the post-COVID era, uh, particularly in the with the uh, events that the city has grappled with, that Philadelphians experience a tremendous amount of trauma, and that we want our system to move from one that historically has sometimes um, increased trauma to a system that. Uh, deflects or reduces trauma. Let me give you an example of one, just one situation. So uh, a couple of years ago, we learned about a, an, a situation where we had a young individual, youth uh, under the age of 10, who reported being in crisis and having suicidal ideation. And this young person uh, made this remark when they were in a treatment setting. And at at the time, this is before our transformation efforts began, uh, all the, the response of the system was the person that's in crisis needed to be transported. And in this particular set of circumstances, the parent could not take that child to the crisis center. So this young person ended up in cops and, and had to be placed in the back of a police wagon as somebody who was already in crisis and ended up being transported to the crisis center. And I can tell you that that was traumatizing for every person involved. The child child, the director of the uh, uh, of the uh, clinical setting that they were in, our crisis center staff and the police officers, everybody involved was traumatized. So our intention is to move from that a system that does that to one that essentially allows crises to be resolved in the community where right there where the person is. So overall, that's the goal is to reduce harm and that includes reducing law enforcement involvement, reducing involuntary commitments, reduction in uh, acute service utilization, that is CRCs and inpatient units, and then increasing the experience of safer crisis care, which includes resolution in the community right there where they live, not having uh, uh, attention drawn to the person uh, through sirens, essentially, increasing warm handoffs and increasing satisfaction. And I would say that we're uh, meeting all those metrics at this time. I did mention the learning collaborative and we had this ran from um, October, 2021 through December, 2022 and engaged several different groups and stakeholders. And as I mentioned, the intention was to standardize expectations and operations between all service providers, agree on best practices and then train our providers in crisis de-escalation. And these were, this is a, a, a listing of the, of the parties that were involved, advocates, persons with lived experience, special needs providers, outpatient providers, substance use providers, grassroots organizations, and global crisis team uh, providers. Let's pivot really quickly to data because um, uh, this, uh, and Philadelphia has been very intentional about selecting metrics that reflect our values that uh, show that we're practicing what we promised essentially. And so I'll walk you through a number of these different data points. So uh, going back to, let's let's start with call center data. Uh, 
I, what I want to this this is a busy slide, but what I want to show you is the average number of calls on this top line here, and that's we've gone. I, I will tell you that when this effort began in 2021, 20, 2020 during COVID, our base now is about 4,500 calls a month. Maybe sometimes even less than that. We've gone up to 6,500 uh, calls per month, <laughs> and that's sort of. Um, that's very welcome. I, I do want to call your attention to the average call length, which is eight minutes, and the average speed to answer, which is 13 seconds. This is uh, very much under the national standards of 20 seconds. I also want to call your attention to the warm transfers from 911. Each of these calls represents a person who called, <clears throat> excuse me, who called 911 for a behavioral health situation. Now, Historically, that would have the response they would have received would be a law enforcement response, some a police officer being dispatched to the situation. And given what we talked about and what we know about the uh, unfortunate statistics, twenty five percent of persons killed by law enforcement are uh, persons in behavioral health crisis. This is something that we, you know, were very intentional about avoiding. If, if if at all possible. So each of these calls is a person who has been deflected from a law enforcement response. And we're very pleased with that. This is a breakdown of crisis calls. And I want to draw your attention to this bottom um, uh, call, uh, this yellow section here. These are the 988 only calls. Philadelphia does operate additional call lines, which include a local 10 digit line, which we spent a lot of time promoting that line and uh, before 980 came online. And so people still use that, but they get the same response from trained counselors. And then Philadelphia also operates uh, a third line, which is like the general line for questions, 302s and so on. And so this, we're, we're pleased that there's been a steady rise in 980 calls, because again, that means that people are uh, seeking help from the behavioral health system and not necessarily from law enforcement. Average answer speed, I showed you this, but what I what you see here is the trends, it's gone down, particularly the 988 line has gone down from about 20 seconds, sometimes more to 13, which we're very pleased with that. And that reflects the training and experience of our staff, reflects a, a tremendous amount of effort to develop the skills of that team and operational efficiency over time. Average call length, this is a proxy for the quality of the intervention. So back in about 2019, when we first started to work on this, the average call length was something like two, was less than three minutes, which was basically was a very quick um, intervention, a very quick uh, interaction with not very much clinical intervention. But over time, our team has been trained. And now, particularly, as you can see in the pink section here, the 988 calls, uh, there's a lot of uh, intervention that is carried out. And sometimes, and these, these are just the averages, some calls take a much longer time to resolve, and our team is happy to do that. Answer rate remains above industry standard as well. Uh, we are about 96% at the 96th percentile for call answer rates, and we're, we're very happy with that. And uh, I wanted to show you this as well. So back in October 2022, Philadelphia, and I want to show you that on this slide, Philadelphia had embedded those crisis counselors in the police radio room with the charge of being present, being intera interacting with the 911 dispatchers, and so and just being available. So when the if behavioral health call comes into 98 to 911. Uh, our counselor, if there's a behavior, there's this call script that the 911 uh, call takers are uh, was developed with uh, in partnership with our uh, police partners, and so the 911 uh, call takers will run through that script, and if it's identified as being primarily behavioral health, then it gets transferred to 988. And I want to show you that since October, there's been a steady rise in those transfers, which is exactly what we want. So those people then go from 911 to the behavioral health system and receive a behavioral health response. Mobile team uh, performance, this is core to today's discussion, but and also core to Philadelphia's efforts. So um, the 
this is a, a graphic that this is, again, this is another busy slide, but I want to show you the uh, dispatches, the CMCRT dispatches. Uh, and they're broken down by adult and child, but you've seen a, again, same trends, a steady increase in those dispatches um, over time since uh, January of 2022, when those teams uh, came fully online, uh, those additional teams came online. And this graphic on the right is a heat map that shows you um, uh, where those calls are emanating, those dispatches are emanating from. And I will say that this maps fairly well onto areas of the city where there has been uh, there, there are other indicators of distress. So things like overdoses and, and so on. Uh, these are regions of the city that historically have received less investment or have uh, and so you, they, this maps along, this maps over pretty well. Uh, and dispatch volume, you can see that has also gone up. Uh, obviously, there's, it fluctuates. We see a, a, a peak here in January 2023, and then we see sort of a level off. And we keep we continue to track that. Uh, you see the same thing with with the on the children's side as well. And uh, I'll just move over to this. This is really important: the community engagement. Now, what does this mean? This basically means uh, this basically means we track what happens at the end of an intervention, at the end of a crisis, an interaction with the mobile teams, and you can see that by far the greatest number of or greatest percentage, I should say, of cases or in or situations that are responded to end up being settled or resolved with the person staying in the community. We do still have a number people that or a percentage of situations that end up requiring involuntary commitment. And we also have a number of uh, situations that involve people voluntarily saying, yes, I don't feel safe. I don't feel uh, this is resolved. I need to go to a crisis center. And our teams are more than happy to transport them there. But this is a sign of success. This um, blue bar here shows that the greater, greatest majority of cases or the greater majority of cases are getting resolved in the, in the community, which is exactly what we want and consistent with our goals and values. This is another way of, uh, of uh, uh, depicting that information. And this is a, we also track, you know, where those, uh, uh, where those dispatches come from. This is a depiction of this. I don't get into too much detail here. Uh, I do want to talk about this, the intervention length and the response time. And so you can see that our response time for the mobile teams to arrive on site is still a little over an hour. Our goal is to get it down to less than an hour. But uh, this has gone down from much a much higher average uh, length of time to arrive. And the intervention length has stayed right around 35 minutes, which, again, we're pleased with. Uh, and it's heading in the right direction. And you can see that, uh, you know, on the right here, that that also fluctuates somewhat. Now, involuntary commitments are important. They're met they're, in our system. We view involuntary, they're necessary. Obviously, not everybody that is in a crisis is aware that they're in a crisis. And so sometimes people uh, require additional intervention and so 302s or involuntary commitments are, are necessary. It is our value in the system that we want these to be applied only when, when, only when necessary because uh, people in, experience an involuntary commitment as being uh, intrusive, as being coercive, and as being oftentimes, they, they, actually, they actually experience it as, as, as traumatizing. They will refer to it for years afterwards my loved one in uh, a 302 me, my provider 302 me, and it's it's uh, so we try to avoid them unless necessary. And you can see that there's been a decline in them. I just want to show you this this 2023 uh, June and July data is is not we don't have we don't have it completely in yet, but I just want to show you the trends that these are tracking down as well, and and the, uh, we still see a good number. of Two twos approved and a good number denied, but uh, this this is a value in our system that we keep an eye on. Now I want to talk very quickly about equity because in this conversation, uh, this is important. 
historically, when we look, one of the things that actually we looked at early on in our in our process here in Philadelphia was we looked at uh, you know how our system serves different populations, and Philadelphia is a majority minority city, and so it was important to us to look at who gets served and how different uh, groups experience our system. And so historically, what we've seen is that 302s, like other course of treatments, tend to be applied disproportionately to Black and brown communities. And, mm-hmm. and so it was important to us to keep an eye on this. And I, I'm almost out of time, so I'll go over this fairly quickly. But the uh, you, this is a call center. Uh, uh, these are a representation of our calls. And you can see that Philadelphia's Black population is something about 40, 44%, 67% of our calls coming in are from black and brown individuals or black individuals. Now, there's a number of ways to look at this. One way is to uh, ask the question, you know, does this in- indicate a higher level of distress in, these pop- in this population? Uh, are they calling because they find the service easier to access, you know, by calling the phone than regular services? Uh, are they aware of the breadth of behavioral health resources that are available in the city? And so this is this raises questions that are important for us as a system to to find the answers to. And so it's important to have the data because it raises questions that need to be answered. This is even more, more pointed. This is a this is a look at the 302, the use of 302s in our system. This is important. Now I I kind of mentioned this in passing earlier, but when we t- we took a look at our data with our partners at the University of Pennsylvania, and we tracked back over about a 16, 17 year period, 18 year period actually of data, 302 data. And we saw that in our system, 302s are actually associated with uh, suicide deaths. So 302s are significant. Now, when you look at the justification, the reasons given for a person being 302'd, you can see a very clear uh, disparity. When harm to others is the reason for 302ing someone, you can see a clear disparity. 67% of those 302'd for a threat or perceived threat of harm to others are Black. That is disproportionate to the representation of this group in the city. Now, let's pause and think about this for a moment. And I won't presume to speak for my law, our law enforcement partners, but when an officer receives a call, the tone of that call is important because it basically alerts the officer to what situation they're stepping into. If a person is, if an officer is told that you're going to protect the public from a dangerous person, that's a very different response uh, mindset than, oh, you're going to help this person that's in distress to get them to safety. So this is important to keep an eye on, and we keep a close eye on this in our system. And I will, I'll actually stop there. Thank you.